We have reached that point in the semester. Yep, we're no longer. Are we simply pawns of the man? We are now rooks, and eventually we will become bishops. Oh, I hate this thing so much. Ah, I don't even care today. All right, so what have we been talking about in this class? What? Systems. systems. Yeah, we've been talking about different types of systems. Um, four classes ago, we started with uh, mechanical translational systems. Uh, then we talked about mechanical rotational systems. We talked about electrical systems. We briefly discussed hydraulic systems, pneumatic systems, heat transfer systems. Uh, we've been through a lot of systems. Um, what has been the goal so far? You're the second person I've talked to today that's named Jackson. Um, it's becoming a popular name, apparently. Uh, I get distracted by names. Um, why are we talking about all of these? What is its relevance to systems and controls? Huh? Somebody watched the lecture on Thursday. Nice work. What we are doing is we're taking the inputs and the outputs and we're deriving a, a correlation between the two. Okay, and these are all simple systems. These aren't the most complex systems you're gonna be dealing with in the world. Um, but the idea is we want to find the relationship between inputs and outputs. And what we use for each of these, um, the elements that we use, really the math behind it, you could use for any derivation of determining what the relationship between the input and output is. Uh, this isn't necessarily something that absolutely requires that you only go with these mechanisms like this. So, um, yep, that's... That's, those are words. So what we're going to talk about today um, is we're just going to go ahead and uh, there's a nice table in your book. If any of you have done your reading assignments for this class already, um, your only reading assignment for this class was to write down that table. Um, that was it. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about that table, though, right now. Um, so to do so, You just go away. I actually made worse progress than I made to go up. Wow. There we go. Um, what we're going to talk about today is we're just gonna kind of link the systems together, okay? So we have our inertial elements. I'm making a table. We have our capacitive elements. We have our resistive elements, okay? And then we have our translational systems. We have our rotational systems. We have our electrical systems. We have our hydraulic systems or pneumatic systems. And we have our heat transfer systems. 
Let me see if. Uh... Oh, nice. So giant table. And the purpose of this table is just to write out generally what each of these components are. Okay? So just kind of an exercise in do you understand what each of these components does? What does an inertial component do? Inertial component is not friction. This is the hard one. Let's go ahead and jump into what does a resistive component do? It's what? It's what? It it doesn't necessarily limit. It's if you want to go back to your last one, friction, is actually a resistive component. It, it provides a source of energy release from a system whereby it is transferred into energy output, um, usually in the form of heat. Although you can have it be in the form of light, electromagnetic radiation, etc., etc. For a translational system, this was friction. And particularly, it was fluid friction. Uh, that we used, but technically any resistive component could be any friction source. Okay? So this is, this component represents energy loss from system. Okay? So, how is energy loss from your system in a rotational system? In a translational system, we have friction. What do we have in a rotational system? I can sit here forever. Somebody just say something. How do we lose energy out of a system here? Here, friction causes heat in a translational system. And if we're generally thinking about heat, what would create heat in a rotational system? A torque caused by also friction. And yes, that is a torque. You may have friction in bearings. You may have friction that is caused by the component actually touching something. You may have friction that exists because of the bending of a spring. Anytime you have a rotational spring, um, anytime you have a rotational spring, there is going to be some heat that is generated by the components moving. What that is, ultimately, it comes from friction. This is the energy loss that comes from a rotational system. How does energy exit a system for an electrical system? What generates heat? It's a resistor. Conductance is, 
the opposite of resistance. Yeah, it's actually one over the resistance. But same idea. So you're at least you're at least you're there. Okay. I find this table. <laughs> it's I think it's section two point five in your book. Okay. For a hydraulic or a pneumatic system, what is caused here is also friction. For heat transfer, what this could be is it could be anything from radiation to convection to even uh, in a heat transfer system, it could be conduction. It's just some form of loss uh, for a heat system. Okay. Uh, you, you could imagine if, if you're looking at the heat system of your house, the heat that's exiting your walls um, and ultimately being absorbed by the environment is, uh, that, that is a source of heat loss. It's not something that we can control. Okay, so capacitive element. Does anybody remember what a capacitive element is? What is the capacitive element for an electrical system? It's, it's a capacitor, yeah. It has actual capacitance. What does a capacitor do? Stores energy. That's what this component is. A capacitive element stores energy, okay? And what this forms is it's actually a potential energy. So in an electrical system, this stores potential energy in the form of an electric field, okay? What about a translational system? How do translational systems store energy? In your vehicle suspension, what component stores energy? The spring. the spring. Okay, and the way that it stores energy is by compressing. The energy that's stored in it is a force times, well it's one half times the spring constant times the displacement squared. That's the energy. Okay, so we got a spring here. Interestingly enough, we have a torsion spring here. This is a torsion, this is a linear spring. Linear spring could either be a tension or a compression spring. Compression springs tend to be a little bit more stable than tension. Drake's got it. We talk about hydraulic or pneumatic systems. What the energy storage is, is actually a volume. The more fluid you have, you can have more fluid at a higher pressure. You're, you're storing more volume. And it allows for you to enact more change if you have that happen. Okay, with a heat transfer, this is basically what's considered an energy uh, a heat sink. It's a source of energy of heat where you can deposit heat or absorb heat from it that basically just has a really high uh, capability of, of holding heat without changing temperature significantly. Okay? So, we've now covered energy being lost from a system, energy being stored in a system, and now we're getting to back to inertial, which is where we started. In an electrical system, the inertial component is what? It's not a resistor or a capacitor. It's the inductor. Okay, what the inductor does 
is the inductor converts a voltage into a magnetic field. It is a different kind of energy storage, but it is an energy storage that occurs as a result of the relationship between voltage and current through the component. Okay? This does end up storing energy, much like the capacitor, but it is in a different form entirely than what the rest of the system is. It's a magnetic energy. Similarly, for a translational system or rotational system, what does inertia mean? The resistance to motion, the resistance to change. Yep. Or as Brandon put it, to stay in motion or stay doing what it's doing. That's what inertia is. Okay? It is, it is a type of, it's kind of like a resistance, but what it is is it ends up storing energy and that energy conversion itself is what brings about the resistance. Okay? So for a translational system, what is the inertia? What is the inertia for your, uh, for your suspension? The road is the forcing function. Remember back to that example. What was, what was the inertial element? Drake just said it's the mass moment of inertia. This is mass, ultimately. It is the weight of the chassis. Yep. Okay, ultimately the mass is what prevents you from moving suddenly. You have to have some finite acceleration. You can't have an infinite acceleration. And it is the mass that prevents you from shooting up in the air. Okay, for rotation, this is the mass moment of inertia. which is basically just mass at a distance. Okay, for the electrical system, it's the inductor. You can't have sudden changes in current in a system because there is a resistance to change that occurs as a result. You can uh, suddenly change a voltage across an inductor, you cannot suddenly change its current. It has that inherent change because it creates a magnetic field that resists itself. Okay? In a hydraulic or pneumatic system, this again is mass. Pressure is more like a force. We're going to, yeah, at the, end, the bottom of this table, I should have done forcing function. Should have. Still have time. Okay, forcing function is usually that it's, it's the power that's being transmitted. For a hydraulic system, that is the pressure. For a translational system, it's a force. For a rotational system, it's a torque. For an electrical system, it's a voltage. Hydraulic pneumatic system, it's a pressure. Heat transfer system, it's a temperature differential. Oh, and then for heat transfer, the inertial element is ultimately the heat of the system. The energy that's stored in the system and how it flows. Energy cannot just suddenly be evaporated from the system. There has to be a finite uh, energy transfer that occurs. Okay? So now we've got 
forcing function. Um, we can also talk about the displacement function. The idea of these are usually the two variables that are interlinked in a system. Here it's force and then, sorry to add two extra rows out of this. This is displacement. For a rotational system, it's angular displacement. For an electrical system, it's current. For a hydraulic or pneumatic system, it's volumetric flow rate. And for a heat transfer system, this is a heat flow rate. Okay. Every system has these types of elements that have them. Anything that has a power will ultimately have some inertia, some capacitance, some resistance, something that drives energy change in the system, and something that ultimately is a systematic value that, that also changes. Okay. This is really what we're looking for. This is a summary of everything we've talked about for the last four lectures. Um, just put in heat and hydraulic and nice terms. Okay, what these are called are these are called analogies. Basically what we have with all of these is if I have a, a linear spring and I have a mass associated with it, okay, Let's say I've got a bar like this, and this bar is rotating on a pivot. Okay, and this bar has some kind of rotational spring that occurs between it and a wall that just keeps it at a certain position. I have another spring that exists between this and a mass and I apply some force to this mass. It is going to cause this system to rotate. And we can ultimately measure how much power is being transmitted through this, how much energy is being transmitted through this, and that will show up in the energy that comes into the system. In the form of kinetic energy, which comes from inertial mass, potential energy, which comes from a linear spring, rotational inertia, which comes from the mass moment of inertia of this bar, and then other potential energy that comes from the extension of this spring. Every one of those components acts together. Every one of those components represents a location for energy to travel when the system is excited. Okay. And when we're looking at the way systems interact, we're looking at where energy is flowing. How does power transfer through a system? Ultimately, power is what links every single one of these systems together. These two multiplied by each other is energy. Energy is the integral of power. These two multiplied by each other are energy, the integral of power. These two multiplied by each other are power. These two multiplied by each other are power. This by itself has power. That's just a temperature. It's, it's a power multiplied by a temperature, if you multiply it together. That one doesn't really work as well. But the, the concept is with each one of these, you have an element of power. And power is transferred between systems by changing angular displacement, by creating a torque. That's what happens right here. This force being exerted by this spring creates a torque and is going to cause an angular displacement. We're going to have that, and it occurs because the end of the spring moves and exerts some force on that system. Okay, we can do this with anything. We can go to look at a hydraulic motor. Hydraulic motor uses the pressure change across the motor with a fixed volumetric flow rate. 
to generate a torque at some angular speed. These are integrally linked because they're a part of the same system. These are integrally linked because they're part of the same system. That's how we transfer power. And this is why systems can be so complex, is because how do you take a force and a displacement, which is what we're doing here, pushing down on the spring, exerting a force, creating a displacement, and turn that into a torque and an angular displacement? We have relationships for that. Theta is equal to uh, what the displacement divided by um, I don't even know what I'm talking about right now. If we're talking about like a circle, the circumference of the circle is equal to pi times the diameter. So if we have a circle that is connected, a pulley that is connected to a uh, conveyor belt system, the linear motion of this conveyor belt system, it's, it's moving in a linear direction, but these systems are rotating. So what you have here is, the angular deformation here, theta, one rotation theta will produce how much linear distance? Well, that's theta times the diameter is equal to the actual displacement of the system. If this rotates one full circumference, two pi theta, the theta equals two pi, this is gonna move one full circumference along the conveyor belt. We have these kinds of relationships that we just have to figure out or we have to know, memorize, whatever, that relates each of these systems together. You will very hardly find a system that doesn't involve at least two elements of this, particularly now that we have so many electrical controls, electrical aspects of this. Okay, so understanding how power is transferred is important. We're going to talk about how to solve each of these equations in two weeks. Um, next week we're going to be working on just the project. So it's time for that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kill a live stream and talk to these people in person. <laughs>